So the title of my talk is Post-Truth Medicine, Death and Disability by Disinformation. As I mentioned, over the last 20 or so years, we've had over $200 million from the pharmaceutical industry to do independent clinical trials. Some of those have had positive results, some negative results, some null results, and those are the results that have been uh, reported. I also am a, sh a share in a patent for a myopathy-related gene um, for statin therapy, but I've waived any fees um, for that. We have, for the last 30 years or so, had a policy of not accepting any personal payments, either directly or indirectly, for example, as salary supplements uh, from commercial entities. I have, though, uh, uh, an important conflict, and I have sought retraction by the BMJ of papers it published containing disinformation about side effects of statins. So what other than alliterative purposes is the word disinformation? I think you probably use a different phrase here, but it's false information intended to mislead. What is post-truth? It's circumstances in which objective facts are less important, less influential, than opinion, or if you like, disinformation. Here's an example of disinformation in the UK, uh, that if we left the European Union, there would be 350 million pounds, so about 500 million dollars a week, available to fund our national health service. The reality, of course, will be quite different. Despite that, disinformation is repeated. So here we have a quote from Boris Johnson, our foreign secretary, from September of this year, repeating this misleading claim and getting his wrist slapped by the head of the UK government statistics for doing so. Does it matter, disinformation? Yeah, truth matters. So here's something that matters. We've had about a 20% reduction in the value of the pound against the dollar and indeed against the euro. And as has been pointed out in The Guardian, Brexit is about the stupidest thing any country has ever done. <laughs> Coming closer to clinical care, although the reality is that Brexit will adversely impact on our National Health Service, not only financially, but also in terms of the loss of continental Europeans who help our NHS to work. But if we come more close to clinical medicine, the example of the MMR vaccine and its link to autism from a paper published in The Lancet in 1998, supplemented by a misleading press conference, and then reinforced by the BBC in a TV program. Only 12 years later, following a partial retraction, and then a full retraction, and the doctor who led it being removed from the medical register, did we actually get some reaction by the medical community to this misleading information. But note, both the journal and the GMC only acted on the basis of inadequate ethics approval and, in, and disclosures of interest, not for evidence of scientific misconduct or fraud. And you have to ask yourself, why do journals not do that? Why do they duck the issue? They're worried about being sued. Uh, they're worried about getting it wrong, but the public health implications of not actually saying that something is not true are substantial. <coughs> so does truth matter? Well, yes. If we look in the UK at the MMR vaccine rates among two-year-olds, they were approaching the 95% level required for herd immunity until that paper and then the reinforcement of the misinformation, disinformation by the BBC and you can see the rate plummeted, and it still hasn't recovered. Does that matter? Yes, look at the measles cases from the impact on measles cases. And the problem with not saying that something is not true is that it gets believed to be true. So here is a press conference from earlier this year with Robert De Niro and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. saying that this link is real. And the rather worrying quote from the Washington Post that uh, Kennedy is being lined up to chair a vaccine safety 
commission. So what's going on? This is a very nice paper in the Journal of Medical Ethics saying there's a real danger that two points of view on the same subject will be presented as if they're more or less equal. Whereas in reality, the two options are wildly unequal in terms of the evidence and their certainty. So on the left, you can see the risks of after actually having measles far outweigh the risks of vaccination, but they're given equal weight. If you've not read it, I really recommend reading this book by the journalist Nick Davis called Flat Earth News. And he makes the point that neutrality is not the same as objectivity. Instead, actually, it's an abrogation of taking responsibility. It means you present conflicting claims and just say, there's controversy. He gives a lovely example. He says, two men go off to mow a meadow. One comes back and says, job done. Another comes back and said, we never cut a blade of grass. So neutrality says, we don't know what happened, you decide. Rather than actually helping people to understand what the truth is by assessing the available evidence objectively. He also goes into detail in this paper about what are the things that kind of drive this disinformation. Public relation creating pseudo groups that sometimes masquerade as spontaneous grassroots organizations which he points out are referred to in PR circles as astroturf because their grassroots are not real. The examples we all know about, the tobacco industry, which sets up in Britain, Forest, which is about the freedom to smoke, the right to smoke. And in the US, the example given of get government off our backs, uh, trying to create a, a perception out there in the public that um, tobacco control is about removing freedoms. Coming closer to our situation, the conflicts of interest of patient advocacy organizations. This very nice paper in the New England Journal earlier this year, 83% of patient advocacy organizations receive funding from industry. Many of them receive substantial funding 40% more than a million dollars a year. 20% of, of them receiving more than 10% of their income. It doesn't mean that they're influenced by it, but it is important to know about it. And as they point out in that paper, the scale of this funding may be underestimated because it's what is in the public domain, and there are ways of providing funding that are not direct. They are laundered through apparent not-for-profit entities. Coming closer to cardiology, a paper in the British Medical Journal by the journalist Nigel Hawkes pointing out that statin intolerance may be an entity that is being created to create a market. <coughs> And if you do internet searches, statin intolerance is a phrase that has appeared only in the last few years. Hawkes points out that the manufacturers have published, uh, sorry, the manufacturers have funded a number of publications related to statin-associated muscle symptoms. That they have established the PCSK9 forum edited by the co-chairs of the report from the European Atherosclerosis Society on uh, statin-associated muscle symptoms. That they have funded charities, in particular in the UK, the Heart UK charity, which argued against the recommendations from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence that the NHS can't afford PCSK9 inhibitors because they're not cost-effective. They may be a perfectly reasonable argument, but these things need to be out in the open. One needs to understand how things are being moved. Again, coming closer, the American College of Cardiology statin intolerance app. This is a device to create a syndrome 
and it's not entirely clear how it helps patients. The website points out that the funding was provided by the manufacturer, the content was independently developed with no sponsor involvement, but people who are involved in developing it take money personally from the pharmaceutical industry. They are paid, effectively, employees of the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a little bit of um, sophistry to say they have no involvement. Again, does it matter? Well, we already know that there are a large proportion of high-risk individuals who are not getting statin therapy. This is survey data from a nationally representative population in the US back in 2010 among people with coronary artery disease or with diabetes aged over 40. Only about half of them actually getting statin therapy. If they didn't have a diagnosis of hyperlipidemia at that time, and it's fantastic the way in which the AHA have changed their guidelines away from lipids towards risk, but at that time, they were even less likely to get a statin despite having these high-risk characteristics. They estimated at that time that there were about 5 to 6 million people with coronary disease and 9 million with diabetes aged over 40 who were not getting statin therapy in the U.S. Is it true elsewhere? Yes. Surveys more recently in Europe, surveys in Australia looking at prescription data show similar trends among high-risk individuals very large proportions of them are not receiving statin therapy. And in particular, you'll notice, among the older individuals, and one of the biggest drivers of risk, of course, is age. And yet, they are uh, even less likely, despite other factors, to be getting statin therapy. Again, does it matter? Well, yeah, I think it does. You know, look at the balance of the benefits. If you take 10,000 people, if you give them an effective regimen and lower their LDL by 80 milligrams per deciliter, over a five-year period, about 1,000 of them out of 10,000 will avoid one or more major vascular event. And in those other high-risk primary prevention settings of people with diabetes aged over 40, about 500 individuals per 10,000 will avoid an event. And if you go on for 10 years, you'll double those absolute benefits. You're halving the risk of life-threatening vascular events. And a bit like the MMR, balance of benefit versus risk, the risks are small. Myopathy, so m muscle symptoms associated with big increases in creatinine kinase, about five per 10,000 against 500 to 1,000 per 10,000. Hemorrhagic stroke, about five to 10 more, but you lower the overall risk of stroke. There's a lot of play about diabetes, around 50 to 100 more people developing diabetes on statin per 10,000. But what are the concerns about diabetes? Increases in macrovascular events? Well, statins lower macrovascular events. Increases in microvascular events? Well, very careful studies have been done showing no effect on microvascular conditions, say in the eye or in the kidney. And at very best, I think if you squeeze the data really hard, you can persuade yourself that maybe over a five-year period, about 50 to 100 will really have symptomatic adverse events caused by the treatment. And we have an extraordinary wealth of large-scale randomized evidence that rules out material excesses of other adverse outcomes. And yet, disinformation. By taking statins, 20% of more will experience disabling symptoms including muscle weakness, fatigue, and memory loss. A year later, in the British Medical Journal, statin therapy has about an 18% risk of causing side effects, from minor to re and reversible to serious and irreversible. What's this based on? Well, the latter claim is based on this particular, very nicely reported study by Zhang and al. from Boston that looked at the reasons why people stop statin and underlined, you'll see where that 18% comes from. Statin-related events recorded among about 17.4% of people in this database who are on statins. But they then pointed out that of those who stopped and then started statin again, 92% of them were still taking the statin after the event. So, so they actually reported that this was likely not to be causal. The disinformation on the previous slide, the deliberate misleading presentation of these data, claiming something quite different. 
another observational study from N. Haynes uh, looked at musculoskeletal pain of any severity. So any kind of ache or pain relating to your muscle or your joints. And they noticed that 22% were reported among patients taking statin versus 16.7 among those not. How was that presented in that paper in the British Medical Journal? It was presented in a completely disinformation way. So what was musculoskeletal pain was, defined, was described as myopathy, a serious complication. They compared this difference with the rate of myopathy defined as muscle symptoms along with big increases in creatine kinase enzymes and said it's 100 times more common than in the trials. Well, if you compare one thing with a completely different thing, you know, I don't know, dollars with yen, they may or may not be 100 times bigger or, or smaller, but what kind of comparison is that? And of course, the problem underlying this particular comparison is that it's not randomized and it's not blinded. So the patients who are given a statin, quite rightly, are different from the ones that don't get a statin. And of course, in an observational study, the people who are getting a statin know they're getting a statin, and the ones who are not getting a statin know they're not getting a statin. It's not blinded. So you have ascertainment biases. And these are particularly problematic here because we do know that statins rarely can cause serious muscle problems. And therefore, you're prompting the reporting in the people that you give statins to. A very beautiful example of this comes from the ASCOT randomized trial. This was a randomized trial that compared statin versus placebo, and separately, in a factorial design, different blood pressure regimens. The blood pressure regimen trial went on for about five years, but the statins were so effective that the Data Monitoring Committee recommended that the results be made available after about two or three years. So, but the patients were followed up for the whole of that five years in the same way, with the same recording of outcomes and the same patients. So during the blinded phase between atorvastatin versus placebo, muscle symptoms were reported equally among people who were taking statin and among those who were taking matching placebo tablets. At the end of that blinded phase, when they continued on in the blood pressure comparison, they were allowed to decide whether or not they wanted to use a statin. And of course, the ones who used a statin knew they were using them. And the ones who were not using a statin knew they weren't. And we see exactly what we see in the observational studies, that when you know what you're taking, you report, in this case, muscle symptoms 40% more commonly. Does that mean that the statin's causing it? No, this means the statin's not causing the muscle symptoms. So again, does truth matter? Well, yeah, we look at the uh, effect of that British Medical Journal paper that I referred to um, with Abramson and his colleagues. There was an analysis of general practic practitioner prescribing data in, in the whole of the UK. And they looked at the effects in a representative sample of practices, and they found a 12% increase in people stopping their statin therapy. There was also a reduction in the numbers of people who are, being, who are starting statin therapy and an impact on GP attitudes. They said, assuming that causality, they would estimate that about 200,000 people across the UK stopped their treatment, and if they didn't resume, then that would translate into two to 6,000 extra events during the next 10 years. Another example of exactly the same thing, this is Australia's ABC TV Catalyst program. The first program was about cholesterol is not a causal risk factor, and the second one was about and statins don't work. Some quotes from that paper, uh, from, the, from the second article. In particular, completely with no context at all, at the very beginning of it, none of the people get statins are less likely to die. This is disinformation. They broadcast the, pro the programs in October 2013. They were withdrawn, whatever that means in this internet age, in May 2014, and a little bit like the MMR, 
due to breaches in impartiality, not because they were utterly misleading. And of course, you can watch them on YouTube now. They're not withdrawn in any sense. Does it matter? Yes. Again, if we look at the impact on prescription data in Australia, there was an increase in discontinuation of statin and a sustained decrease in dispensing statins. Again, the author said, assuming causality, over the next five years, they would assume that that would translate into about 1,500 to 3,000 preventable and potentially fatal heart attacks and strokes that would otherwise have been avoided. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is observational studies are fine for big effects on rare outcomes. They're fine for demonstrating that statins increase the risk of myopathy, a rare uh, and serious complication with muscle symptoms and big increases in creatinine kinase. But they're useless. They're absolutely without value for determining the effects of moderate effects on common outcomes. And, and why, why is that? Well, because the differences in the underlying risk of health outcomes between people who do and don't get treatment are so different. And the differences in the ascertainment of health outcomes between people who receive a treatment and those who don't are so different. So we should dismiss as disinformation non-randomized observational studies about the effects of moderate outcomes. Now, there was a very nice paper that looked at this and demonstrated it very clearly and carefully uh, in the New England Journal, looking at the effects or the associations of statins with cancer. We know from the randomized controlled trials, and here I show the analysis of uh, the, the, the large long-term trials of statins from the cholesterol treatment trial as meta-analysis, that during a five-year treatment period, there is no excess of cancer overall or at any particular site. And in those, a number of those randomized trials, they have then continued long-term follow-up and shown no emerging effect on cancer of five years of statin therapy. In the New England Journal, though, in a Danish population study, uh, there was a highly significant non-causal association of statin use with lower cancer mortality. So in the box, you'll see that there is a lower risk, a relative risk less than one, among people who are taking any dose of statin for cancer. Why do I say that's non-causal? Why did the authors really conclude it was likely to be non-causal? Well, the same analysis suggests that statin increases the risk of cardiovascular events, which we know is not true. This is a very good observational study. It is the whole of a population. It's very large. They used the best statistical methods, and they got precisely wrong answers. They're very precise, but precisely wrong in terms of what does statin do to cancer or to cardiovascular uh, mortality. And of course, you can adjust away that anomalous result for cardiovascular mortality, but those adjustments aren't necessarily the right adjustments to get the right answer for another outcome, such as cancer. So remarkably, I think, despite it being 50 years since randomized trials were introduced by Austin Bradford Hill, I think we still don't really have a belief out there in their power that randomization allows us to compare like with like so that any differences in outcome can be inferred to be causal. That blinded control allows unbiased comparisons of events defined in the same way in the different treatment groups. This is an extraordinary strength. What it means is, as long as you do things equally badly or equally well in the treatment groups, you will get an unbiased assessment of the effects of treatment. They're remarkably robust to ascertainment bias because it's applied to both, to, to, to ascertainment issues, because it's applied equally to both groups in blinded studies. And therefore, if we have trials which are sufficiently large, then we can get unbiased assessments of both the safety and efficacy of treatments. And yet, reasons are given. Here's a paper from the expert opinion, opinion being the 
probably the, the emphasis rather than expert, Drug Safety Journal, 2013, that some types of, of what's wrong with the randomized evidence? Well, the first thing is some types of adverse event were not systematically sought or potentially subject to selective non-response. Again, missing the whole point of a randomized controlled trial. You don't need to know what you're looking for in a randomized trial. Trials are agnostic. They have no interest in you know, whether the effect goes one way or the other. They just look for differences. That's the beauty of randomized controlled trials. So here's an example with niacin, a drug that's been used in the US for 50 years. Lots and lots of observational studies, pharmacovigilance, never picked up the fact that it increased the incidence of diabetes, infections, and bleeding, demonstrated in this randomized blinded trial. As I say, none of this was detected by observational data, clearly detected by trials that were not looking for it. It's argued that the trials are usually only powered to detect efficacy and not adequately powered to identify adverse events. I find this one quite bizarre. Again, the trials are not interested in what kind of event you want to look at. They'll tell you the sa have the same power for efficacy as adverse events, you, if they have the same rate. And of course, with statins, we have this enormous amount of data, this meta-analysis from Naveed Sattar uh, and David Price, uh, a meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials of statins uh, detected the increase in diabetes. And as David Price points out, before this result, there were no observational studies that had assessed the effects of satin on diabetes. After it had been published, there were 20 or 30 published papers, and you thought, what a waste of paper. What's the observational studies adding to this clear evidence? And we have here a clear effect on diabetes, great power to detect it. Another objection that uh, the trials were uh, done in pe uh, by excluding people who had problems with statin therapy. Well, many of the trials were started before statins were on the market. So people never had the chance to find out that they had so-called statin intolerance. So this is just not true. That it excluded people who are at extreme, ex increased risk of myalgia you know, on the basis of age, renal impairment. Well, it's certainly true that some trials ex excluded elderly people, but then other trials included them. That some trials excluded people re with renal impairment, but some trials included them. And again, one can take an example of the corona trial. People aged at average 73, very frail with heart failure. We can look at muscle symptoms, which were recorded systematically in this trial. There is little or no difference between those taking resuvastatin or blinded control. Nor is there any difference in terms of the severity uh, between the different groups. Statin intolerance is a marketing tool. It does not exist in the way in which it's being presented. A and then the... I think, kind of most irritating canard of all, that patients were excluded because they had pre-randomization run-in periods with study treatment. Well, the truth is that most of the trials did not have run-in periods. The truth is that most of the trials that did have a run-in period used a placebo, which excludes people who will be non-compliant irrespective of what treatment they get. It actually increases the sensitivity of a randomized trial to detect effect. And a paper published by Thompson et al. in the American Heart Journal that did a meta-analysis of muscle problems in some 42 blinded studies and found little difference, maybe 0.3% you know, difference over a three-year period on average, so about 0.1%, one per thousand per year. They pointed out explicitly that only three of the trials used a drug run-in phase. Actually, it's, quite, it's wrong. One of them, at the CARE study, it is unclear from the paper, did not have a run-in, a drug run-in, had a placebo run-in. But they pointed out it, that it doesn't, it isn't a, a reason for the lack of difference here. This was published in 2014. Here's our media. This is the BMJ editor making misleading statements on national radio, actually our most prominent news radio program, the Today program. The risk of elderly people getting off their, going off their feet, no longer being able to get out of a chair or climb the stairs with statin. 
The interviewer said, uh, but, but there have been a tiny number of those cases, haven't they? And she says, oh, no, 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 not at all. I think we haven't really studied them. 140,000 randomized patients later. There haven't been enough of them in the randomized trial. Also, the trials underreport adverse events. In many of these trials, several of them, there were run-in periods where people who experienced side effects were excluded. Just, this, is, this isn't misinformation. This is disinformation. And however you cut it, if you look in the large randomized trials of long-term therapy, among the people who had a pre-randomization run-in with statin therapy, the heart protection study in HOPE 3, or among those who didn't, corona, which I showed you in heart failure, or eight other trials. You can see the excesses over a five-year period are about 0.2 to 0.4 percent, about one per thousand per annum. Horizontally, if you look at muscle symptoms being sought specifically, again, a difference of around, at most, one per thousand per annum. So in conclusion, unlike MMR, where disinformation has resulted in increases in measles, but in the main, at least in Western populations, little adverse effect in terms of death and disability. The disinformation in cardiovascular medicine caused by these misleading claims about statin are killing many people. And I think that what we need to do is think about the balance not neutrality, but the balance between the range of reasonable expert interpre interpretations of the evidence. And we should exclude from that balance the non-experts, be they flat earthers, be they anti-vaxxers, be they people who believe in homeopathy or statin deniers. So my final slide, what are the solutions? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think, though, that what we see is that if we don't deal with disinformation rapidly, robustly, and by trusted rebuttal, it lives on. That medical journals should be more prepared to correct the scientific record, not just when authors or their institutions agree to retract, which from my discussions with the editors is really what happens that medical and scientific organizations should have processes for rapidly assessing and rebutting robustly misleading claims. As researchers, and indeed the clinical community is large, we should be more aware of the strengths of randomized controlled trials, particularly with blinding, and the weaknesses of observational studies for assessing the kinds of effects that have been claimed for statins. That journalists, should, as Nick Davis pointed out, not confuse neutrality with balance between informed experts about the interpretations of evidence. And everybody should consider whether potential interests, financial or otherwise, are leading to misinformation, because truth matters. Thank you. So, Sir Collins, please accept this plaque in recognition of your outstanding and very productive 2017 Paul Dudley White Lecture. Thanks very much.